What made you decide to do him as an outpatient, Keith? Well, as you know, uh, it, there's no code for Medicare as an outpatient, so most total knees, not partial knees, but total knees, patients uh, that are not on Medicare, will evaluate them for some type of organ failure. If they don't have an organ failure, then they're a candidate for an outpatient total knee. So really anyone under There's the no age of 65. There's no score that you would use, right? Say it again. There's no score that you would use? No, it's a, we use a pretty simple scoring system. Do you have an organ failing or do you not? Okay. And that's worked in about 5,000 cases, is that right? Yeah, so we've done uh, 5,200 cases as of the first of this month as an outpatient, hips, knees, revisions, shoulders, et cetera. Um, the interesting thing is that 14% of our patients have more than uh, one significant medical comorbidity. Uh, 43 or 47% have at least one significant medical comorbidity, including previous coronary artery disease that's been treated, uh, thrombophlebitis or VTE as this patient had, morbid obesity, OSA as long as it's treated. As long as the organ's not failing uh, and it's been optimized, then we really consider everyone to be an outpatient. Okay. Tell us so what I've you're marking out, there. Yep. So tibial tubercle is here. This is his previous ACL incision, which we're going to follow because it's distal and it's medial enough that we can follow it. Then we're going to go sort of curvilinear around the uh, me medial patellar up to, what I like to do is kind of take the first fold above the kneecap, and that's usually about where we need to be um, to do our arthrotomy. So we'll come up into flexion. Uh, kind of the whole practice does it this way, but we do our approach in flexion. We're also going to close the knee in flexion. Getting started. So we're going to come up and what we want to do is just expose the, the fibers of the VMO right as they attach into the uh, quad tendon. So you're going to do a standard medial palpatal arthrotomy. Have you done yeah. the, uh, any of the trivectors or the uh, mini midvastus, subvastus? I, I have. I've done, I've done all of them. What I'm doing is I, I, you maybe call a trivector. Basically, as you see, I'm taking just a few fibers of the VMO off with the quad. I don't know that it makes right. any real difference and it's just three or four centimeters above the proximal pole of patella, just so that we can get enough medial exposure here. Okay, straighten around. Um, the I next see you're using of, uh, a tourniquet. You want to talk to me about why you're using a tourniquet? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I think you gave that tourniquet talk for me at uh, Seth's meeting in the winter. Um, I don't know why I'm using the tourniquet other than I think that's how you taught me how to do it. Um, the, the data really doesn't strongly support uh, its use. Um, we do it sort of for convenience. Um, I don't know if because it's an outpatient, I mean, the data just shows that there's probably no real increased risk of, of bleeding or transfusing whether you use it or not. So I think for me, it's just a, a matter of convenience. The screw is right here. We should be able to get this out relatively easily. I'll go ahead and take it out. Um, this is a valgus knee, basically. So I'm going to be relatively, I wouldn't say cautious, but I'm not going to be super duper aggressive with my medial exposure. I don't call this a medial release um, until we really start working on the posterior medial corner. So you're just really removing the meniscal capsular ligament coming around just to that uh, medial, medial corner there. Correct. We're going to hope that this 3-5 screwdriver fits in and it does. That's wonderful. So now we're going to code for removal of hardware complex deep and we're going to put 50,000 <laughs> modifiers on there. Uh, do you use TXA? This patient had a history of DVT. Yes, everyone uh, gets oral tranexamic acid at our center for all arthroplasty procedures. Would it fair, be fair to say, because there's another question, that your DVT prophylaxis is going to be a low molecular weight heparin in this patient for a few so days? This patient will get low molecular weight heparin for show. For 14 days, along with the portable compression devices. Correct. I'm just going to keep moving while we're talking, but that's exactly right. Yeah. And we only do uh, the expanded chemical prophylaxis in those patients who have... Um, uh, a previous history, a personal history, family history, et cetera. Adolf, if right, you so look here. So we saw here, you pointed um, out the disease in the medial condyle. Yeah, so here's So you made where the right we, call. I, I think this may have been iatrogenesis. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We saw a little something, so we went after it with the scopatology. Um, he probably yeah. would have had otherwise a normal. And his ACL graft uh, is there. I don't know if it's working, but it's there, uh, but not for long. Any All points right, so. on where I should be making that introductory pilot hole that you just made? So I'm just about to say something about that because we usually do it right in the center, right along the AP axis or white sides line. Uh, the true center may be medial or lateral. You'd have to template it to really know. And in order, and the reason that we do that is that makes our starting point a little more lateral, which pushes us into a little bit more valgus than perhaps what the guide would show. So 
we set this on four degrees. And the reason we set it on four is that because our starting hole is a little bit more lateral than the true central axis of the femur, as we've done our radiographic reviews for multiple studies, including patient-specific guide studies, et cetera, we have found that um, it, uh, it, it measures five or six, or a little over five on average, uh, post-operatively. So, and Leo, who's here somewhere, published that in 1987, actually. Exactly. Uh, that if you started your hole there, you were probably cutting it at about five or six degrees of uh, valgus. So, Dr. Lombardi, I mentioned to so you a little bit earlier that we were going to, um, based on preoperative templating, we were going to flex this component an extra three degrees, and that's what this cutting guide does. It's going to flex the femur. Why would component. that be? Well, because based on his templating, he's got a pretty good bow to his femur. And if we okay. just use an intermediate rod. So if he flexes rod, it three degrees, he'll enhance his posterior collar offset, he'll avoid notching the anterior femur, and he'll follow that bow, as he just said. Okay. Now, if we were so doing do we know, uh, the question I have here, I'm sorry to, to keep bugging you, no, is what's fine. that oral dose of TXA? Do you, do you know, remember what the oral dose of TXA is? Um, let me two see pills. if I could ask our anesthesia colleague. They may know her. Do you know, Jason? Two pills. It's two pills, but I think they're like 635 or something. <laughs> what's the dose? It's like 12, yeah, it's 1,200. Let's call it 1,200. It's, two, it's two pills. Eight, 18 and change, whatever. <clears throat> So, so the, uh, the question is, um, are the, the question I got here is the incision's quite small. Are these microplasty instruments? These are standard uh, instrumentation um, that we're able to achieve by moving the mobile window of the knee. Uh, as you noted, we did, the, we did the, um, the exposure and flexion. Then in placing that distal femoral cutting guide, we brought him down to about 60 degrees of extension or 60 degrees of flexion. That opens up that mobile window and allows us to maneuver within it. Let me pop this posterior meniscus. You can see where he's had parts of his posterior meniscus taken out there. Um, so those of you who want to look up the mobile window, uh, look up uh, Dr. Laskin, and he's the one who wrote about using the mobile window uh, for using a smaller incision. So you know you can d decide whether or not you want, how large you want to make the incision. And all Dr. Barron's doing here is just optimizing his view at different points. Right, and so he's I'll got tell something there protecting his medial collateral. He's got the tibia uh, forward with that posterior homin, and he's protecting his uh, lateral side with another homin. So all and, things and the, are visualized. The most you notice he's thing. using ocular navigation to do this operation. It's a very, very sophisticated technique. Yes, I'm ocular navigating. If we go, uh, if we look at this view down here, maybe zoom out just a tad. You can see I'm going to line this up with the crest of the tibia. I'm not purposely going to aim for any, quote, constitutional or gentleman's varus, uh, particularly not in a valgus knee. Go ahead. Are you going to put any slope in this tibia? Yes. Yeah, so this, this cutting guide has a six degree slope built into the, the actual attachment of the head. And so that's why I am, I am just neutral or slightly uh, a little less than parallel with the uh, tibial crest so that I can get five mm -hmm. to six degrees of slope here. And then I want to be parallel in the frontal plane as well. Mm -hmm. So he's showing you exactly the way you want to get that uh, guide oriented, uh, both for varus valgus as well as for flexion. Uh, and he understands <laughs> that this guide has that six degrees. Some implants have the slope built into it. Uh, some you have to actually add the slope. Average to the slope is usually about eight to nine degrees. And really the, the mo the, one of the most important things here is protecting your, protecting your soft tissues. We can all cut uh, on the saw bones. We can all color by numbers. Um, and especially if you're trying to do it through this sort of mobile window of Laskin, um, protecting the MCL and protecting the patellar tendon are, are paramount. Uh, you, yeah. We're going to jump to this, but uh, I'm going to use a, a ultra congruent or anterior stabilized type bearing, and so um, I'm not terribly concerned about making an island or doing anything funky in the back of the knee here. So when you do a ultra congruent bearing, do you still need to add the slope like when you do a cruciate retaining? Well, so no, you don't need to do as much. The, as you well know, I, I, we went down a pathway of cruciate retaining. Uh, I tended to use a, a lipped cruciate, which didn't have the slope in it. Um, and then I've gone to using uh, the AS or ultra congruent in nearly everyone. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, I've, I've not changed the way I cut the tibia, and I've been happy with come on out, my results and, and with the balancing of the knee. So um, I, right. you could definitely take so a little slope That was the point I want to make. Is that you you don't want to be excessive in your slope, but if he's only cutting six degrees of slope, he can do a PS knee or he can do a uh, ultra-congruent bearing. 
but when you start to get more excessive than that, that's when you get that flexion extension mismatch and imbalance. Yes, and you have to know your implant too to know uh, how that's going to affect, you know, particularly if you flex the femur and you cut slope and you've got a PS knee that doesn't have a lot of clearance for hyperextension, you're creating an issue. Let me see the marking pen. I know I don't normally do that, but we've got some colleagues here that we want to show. I just heard someone say that I shouldn't use the epicondylar axis, so I won't do that. Who what I will that? do is, huh? Someone said that. Dennis, maybe? Um, <laughs> Dr. Nam? So I'm going to mark what I well, believe Well, I think it was uh, Dr. Stuhlberg, I think he's here as well, who, who uh, did a study where he looked at the T axis versus marking the AP axis, and he was more accurate uh, with the AP axis. So I would agree with that. So I'm going to use the AP I axis. I usually mark them both, but this is fine. But so what I will say is this is a mechanical guide that I have set at three degrees. I'm not going to set this at three degrees until I confirm that I like that. And I'll show you how I do it. It's a little bit of a hybrid uh, measured resection versus gap balancing. So is this preset or you say you set it at three? I, you can set it at, at zero, three, or minus three. Okay. Okay. And so what, what I'm going to do before I punch it to set that is I'm going to check with a lamina spreader how this kind of looks. I'm going to relax on the patellar tendon. I'm going to take the lamina spreader. And I'm going to put this in here and I'm just going to get an idea of do those, where those holes are going to be punched, does that look pretty good in flexion? And it does. If it looks to me that like these good. two are parallel to the tibia when I do this, and that's where they're going to be punched, so I'm happy with that. If I needed to pull it down in a bad varus knee, put it in neutral for a, a different, maybe a valgus knee or a hypoplastic condyle, I would do whatever I needed to do to make that uh, amenable. So I'm going to punch those well, in. This was truly a, a tight one valgus. You know, it was oh, yeah, correctable, yeah, yeah. right? It, it's correctable, so probably. We didn't, we didn't think there was going to be a lot of lateral condylar erosion. So, but that trick that he's talking about is you can r roll it off of that lateral condyle in order to get it perfectly aligned if you have to. If you need more, you roll it off. If you need less, you can flip it to zero, or you can even roll the medial side down a little bit. So I've got this lined up kind of on that lateral most flare uh, of the trochlear groove. And I'm going to say that it's going to be a five, because I know I've cut three degrees of slope in, so I'm going to be aiming away from the femur. He's got a lot of bow, so I'm going to cut a five. Templated to a five, going to cut a five. Okay, the question I have while you're taking that off uh, from the audience is, um, I know you did exactly the way I would do it, but how did you know how much bone you were taking off that tibia? I that already tib told him you were doing ocular navigation, but was, were you shooting for something is probably the question. Yeah, I, you know, as you well know, we're shooting for a 10 millimeter uh, poly and everybody. I'm okay with a 12. I'm okay with a 14, but I don't want a big thick poly. We're good with just one probably, as long as Jason keeps an so eye So you're out looking there. Uh, in this valgus knee, you took a little, little more off the medial side than you would probably typically in a varus knee. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Almost a, a okay. real cut that it seemed about equal, and that's what it looks like on our template preoperatively. Um, yeah. So here again, if you really wanted to double check, I know Mike Barron does this with uh, two lamina spreaders. You take this Lombardi tibiofemoral spreader. It's actually wedge-shaped where it needs to be, and you can place it underneath here, flex it up, and you've got a nice rectangular flexion gap. So I'm pretty Take happy with that. Take your hand away there for, your right hand away for a second. Great, thank you. Okay. That looks really good, good. You want to make sure this thing's well fixed and it's not crappy bone. If you do that with crappy bone, it'll, it'll do something bad. So, saw? I've got it right here. Here it is. Okay, my head's just gonna sneak in the way just for a second so I can safely, uh, So he's got the retractor perfectly placed there to protect the medial collateral ligament, as you see. And then he's got uh, a retractor placed uh, laterally to protect the LCL and, and the uh, tendon. The standard four-in-one cutting block. What happens and this is what we tend to do. Here. We tend to cut posteriorly first. Yeah, I tend to cut posteriorly first. And then um, with, with this system, because we were sort of in between a five and a six, I'm going to cut a five. Anteriorly, if I needed to stop, that way I haven't, uh, haven't done anything I can't recover from here. That looks pretty good there. All right. So if I wanted to downsize, would I have to change my posterior cut? No, sir. So it's a poster referencing system? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> so typically, uh, it, you know, when, when I make a Second. cut, if I cut too large, it's pretty easy to slap a block on. Yep. I also use a posterior referencing system you see this and off. go ahead and uh, just remove bone anteriorly. Yeah, just gonna finish this anterior cut. So I think this right. is a nice trick, you know, what he did right there, just go part of the way and then you can actually take the saw blade and do a little bit of blending as we were taught by John Insall a long time ago. 
and you blend if you need to. We didn't really need to here, but what you can do is, you notice I left that piece intact. I didn't like crack yes. it off and then try and freehand it. And so your initial right. cut on that piece acts like your cutting guide, because it's like a slot and it controls your, uh, it controls your cut. So, you know, that's just a perfectly flush resection, piano sign, whatever you want to call it. That looks good. Come on out. One of the first things we have to teach the fellows when they arrive, uh, otherwise you get that little sign there that you don't like to see. The Merrill Ritter doesn't matter if you notch sign? That's right. The Merrill Ritter doesn't, match, doesn't matter. Lamination spreader? All right, so we've done our bony prep. We've done a tiny bit of gap balancing ice light, let's say. Um, where we, you know, just were checking. I don't think anybody who's a gap balancer believes that was gap balancing. <laughs> okay, uh, that was, I would have changed it if it looked like I needed to. How's that? Okay, why didn't you irrigate after the bone cuts to remove debris and help prevent infection? Do you have a high infection rate? Uh, we have um, a total knee infection rate of 0.00, .00 out of the thousands that we've done okay. here at White Fence. Um, I'm sure it will happen someday, and uh, Hopefully it won't be this guy. I'm not familiar with the data that says that if you irrigate that stuff out right now that it prevents infection. Uh, is that some new data that you heard this week, Adolf? I'm just answering a question I have not oh. heard, but uh, you know, we'll okay. have to ask uh, uh, some of the other smarter individuals that are here. Uh, the other question is, uh, did you do any different pre-op workup for this patient? Because he had multiple operations and injections or any difference in antibiotics. But I don't so, recall you saying that he had any, any infections from any of his surgeries, did you? He has no history of infection, okay? Right. Um, and you made the point to say that the steroid injection was, I think, over three months ago. Yes, that, that is, you know, if you look at the data, uh, 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 Kushner and his group and John Callahan uh, separately, come on out. So I'm happy with my clean out there. Uh, two good big studies uh, last year, uh, decreasing risk of infection month over month, out to, I think, one of the studies said seven months, but. Uh, it tended to go down to what we think is a manageable risk at about three. Is that what you're doing now, Adolf, is three, right? Yes, absolutely. So and, notice and he used the femoral tibial spreader, medial lateral. He removed all the meniscus. He didn't leave any of it behind. Obviously, he was putting his finger in there, feeling for any posterior osteophytes, which we didn't really see on the, the lateral, but that would be Lamination. extremely important to remove. And now he's got his tibia exposed once again. That thing. And he's going to size this tibia for us. Let me ask you a quick question first, which I'm going to do, but what am I working on over here? This is something you taught me I didn't know existed, and, and we've seen it uh, both intraoperatively that we've been able to repair, and we've seen it postoperatively as well. And yeah. I find that so right here the I, best spot to look for it. Right. So if you, if you put in an implant and you feel so. that it's snapping and popping, you've left a little osteophyte uh, in the region of the popliteus, so you want to go there and get it out, or you can do what uh, Truesdale does and just release the popliteus, I guess. That's correct. If you release it, um, it rarely snaps. Oh, snap. sorry, I missed it. How did the question is? How did you flex that femur three degrees? Well, that was actually built into the to the jig. You said correct. Correct. So it's a secondary. It's a, I, I pinned it through the pinning guide, uh, which would then cut it at neutral, or right. I placed a three degree uh, accessory cutting guide onto the femur to flex it. And so I don't the system flex has it every a separate time. cutting guide that will allow you to to flex that three degrees. Correct. And I don't flex Great. it every time. Um, if it looks like on the lateral, and we don't get a full leg view, so it's got to look like it on that, on that, uh, our lateral view from the office. If it looks like it's got, um, so here's our five. So what I'm going to do here, there, there's a couple of steps here, and I'm doing this specifically because of the all poly tibia, and I'll tell you about it in a second. I'm looking now, is at this, this a symmetric or asymmetric tibia? This is a symmetric tibia. Um, and okay. I have found that it, it fits pretty well. It's got a pretty nice shape. Um, go ahead and drill. So tell us what the tips are. Are you lining up with the medial bone there? Are you lining yep, up the central third of the patella? Over. Does it make okay. a difference? So I saw a study, and I've subsequently not seen it published, but it had really good data. It was out of uh, Japan in bilateral total knees. Um, and they said that the most accurate way to reproduce the anatomic rotation of the tibia was to make the anterior border of the implant and the anterior border of the tibia concentric circles. So that's my number one, is I want these to be concentric. If, and, and, there, and that's only with a symmetric tibia. So if you have an asymmetric tibia, that may change it. I don't have much experience with an asymmetric tibia. But so that's my number one. Can you one. show us your alignment? You got an alignment rod in there. Can you show yep, us the alignment? Hey, I was going, hey, yeah, hang on. Um, then, so we're talking about rotation for a sec. The anterior okay. tibia, so the, 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 the radius of the anterior tibial implant 
and the radius of the anterior tibial bone are, are I'd say parallel, but they're, they're concentric. That's my number one. Yes. My number two, okay. where's my tibial tubercle and where's my okay. origin of the, or insertion of the PCL? And I actually want it slightly, the, the center of the tray slightly medial to the, to the PCL footprint. I like that. And then this should be coming right off the medial border to the tubercle. And then I can look at my overall limb alignment of the tibia and I can see that it looks pretty good. It looks like it's parallel to the long axis of the tibia here. And then I can also look at my slope from the side view, and I can see that I'm basically parallel with the crest of the tibia. Okay? Okay. That looks so I'm great. Happy with that. Good view now, there. Thank you. What I've done is I've pinned now, this guide. Um, now, because the I'm The question using, I have here is... Mm -hmm, go ahead. I, they, the question is being asked, why not remove the ACL before establishing the flexion gap height and rotation and making irreversible bone cuts? But I thought you did take out the ACL right the off the ACL, bat. The ACL was gone either when I cut the distal femur because I tried to get it with the saw or when I subluxed right. the tibia forward. Obviously, there's no ACL right. when the tibia is sitting over here and, yeah. and scranting. So when the, he subluxed that tibia forward with, before he cut it, he had already released the ACL. Correct. So, Adolph, I'm going to put this tibial trial in place. And I've already, because we're using a monoblock all poly tibia, I've already put my trial poly on, okay, just to make okay. sure that I'm not running into any troubles. Then I'm going to hold it down. They're going to take out the retractors. And we're going to lift up on the femur. Perfect. So okay. you don't like any blocks or anything, huh? Uh, this is going to be my block, and it's going to look a lot like the, the trial implants. Oh, okay. This was what, so what are you the doing artist now? formerly, that's the mm. artist formerly known as the PCL. Okay, so there, that was the next question. I'm going to use a, a ultra congruent or anterior stabilized bearing. Now, Adolph, this is a uh, this is a symmetric femoral component, not asymmetric. So you might ask mm -hmm. Jason what his thoughts are on that, because there's some complexity with the way this thing's designed, such that it it functions like an asymmetric tibia, but there's only there's no right and left. And I'm, Jason can explain that for us, maybe. Yeah. So the um, no right and left femur. There's no right and left femur, and the and it's a kind of a dual Q angle type trochlear groove in which it's, it's nine degrees in both directions. So it'll allow the patella to track well whatever kind of side you put it on a right or a left. And what's interesting is that because of the, the kind of taper of the universal style trochlear flange, that you don't have to worry about lateral overhang proximally like you do with a more of an anatomic femoral component design. Okay, Can you say so it one more time? I, we missed that. What was that now? Go over that again, because I didn't, I didn't get that either, quite honestly. Wait, which one? The lateral overhang issue? Yeah. So if you look up here, so if you can see right from it, you don't, because you don't have a lateral trochlear bias like you have in an anatomic trochlear flange on an anatomic component, you don't have to have, okay. you don't ever have a lateral overhang. You see here, there's no yeah. lateral overhang no matter how big you get. Would we need to move this more laterally? No, because, and that, that's what looks somewhat unique about this implant is that even though it looks up, in the trochlear flange that it might not be lateral enough, you know that because of the geometry of the trochlear groove that one, it is, and then number two, I base my medial and lateral position of the component on what it looks like in flexion with respect to the lateral epicondyle. Yes. Yeah, so and the lateral border of the condyle. We're looking at That's the That's what you're looking at the here. The width of the bone here. So, so if, you were, uh, if you had a little narrower femur, you would displace it as far lateral as possible? I always put it as far yes. lateral as possible. Okay. I, I'm getting pretty happy here. The yeah. one thing that I like to do is particularly So how in much obese anterior translation, the question is bring that back to flexion, Keith, and how, tell us how much anterior posterior translation do you accept well, at 90 right degrees? Well, right now, this is, at 90 degrees, this is, I'm going to have a lot because this is not the uh, ultra congruent bearing. This is a standard CR bearing, which okay. I've always used and always then put in the ultra congruent. So I want to have it. Uh, a little bit loose in flexion, not grossly loose, but I, I want, I mean, I could almost dislocate them in flexion, but this is a standard CR and I've taken out the PCL. The one thing that I do like to do, and this is gonna play with our rotation a little bit, is, let me see the gray beauty. I like to check my flexion gap, particularly in the obese patient. He's not obese, but I just wanna show you this trick. I like to check it with my osteotome. I want a millimeter or two of gap here, and I want a millimeter or two of gap here. So that looks pretty good. I feel like I'm pretty well balanced in flexion. In the obese patient, you can do this all day long. If they've got a big heavy thigh or a big huge muscular thigh, it's very difficult to know exactly what, uh, what your balance is. So I'm, I'm happy with this. With, and this is a 10 poly. I've got full extension. 
I've got no, really no extra laxity in extension, even medially with my approach. Mid flexion, I mean, this looks pretty good to me. Full flexion, the, you know, I don't have that polo sign, of course, because I don't have a PCL. I'm relatively happy with that. I'm looking at my rotation and flexion. Do I need to change my rotation at all of the tibia? It seems to be articulating right where I want it. So I'm happy with that. It's kind of hidden under the, oh, that looks pretty good. Um, I'm gonna punch for the keel. There is a, a uh, all poly punch that you can go straight to. It's, it looks a little aggressive in my hand. So in, in younger folks like this 55 year old, I'm gonna use the standard punch first. You don't necessarily have to, come on out. But I just find that um, I'm a little more comfortable not having to hit it quite as hard. And so here is the all poly punch. The all poly has a little bit longer keel and a little bit uh, more aggressive keel geometry. So the question I have here in front of me is, uh, how does this all tibia, all poly tibia, work better than the uh, AGC experience of Merle Ritter? Oh yeah, so the AGC, come on out. Uh, that was interesting experience because that's a flat on flat uh, geometry that's super duper constrained in the coronal plane and un totally unconstrained in the sagittal plane. And so um, that, that tibia, as you well know, uh, without the metal backing, uh, the forces tended to go straight through the poly and would kill this uh, medial tibial plateau in varus knees, particularly if the knee was left in a little bit of varus, uh, despite what some of our colleagues would say from their studies. So we'll take those implants, please. We've got a five, How often ten, do you have to do five. a lateral re uh, retinacular release with this system? Jason? Um, I don't think I, we've, I have not done one lateral release on this system. Yeah, I don't think I've and, done and one And I either. think that, you know, um, with the Q angle being a little bit higher, actually, you have a little more freedom with a nine, with rough, roughly nine degrees of a Q angle. What okay. is that injection? Epinephrine, one to a thousand, point zero five, zero point five cc's, uh, 30 cc's of 0.5% noropin, Toradol, 30 milligrams, and fill it up with some saline. So you're injecting all the periosteal tissue there? Yeah, I mean, as you well know, um, our anesthesia team does a spectacular job with the uh, preoperative ultrasound guided uh, regional anesthetics. We give this patient what's called an IPAC block, not your iPod, but your IPAC, which is something acronym that's something about the interval between the posterior capsule and the artery and all the nerves and in the, the back of the artery. Um, so, and so they do the that under ultrasound. Capsule poster uh, is already is done by the uh, radiologist under ultrasound. The all, anesthesiologist. Under, the anesthesiologist. They also do an adductor canal block. Yep. And this patient is under a general anesthetic. Yeah, a real light general, but they are definitely under a general. And then we do the local uh, injection, as he's showing you here. And I, I do not have now, the data you know, to Mike, support uh, this. The but question is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, back home, Keith, it's 620, and, the, and they're saying, is he definitely going to go home tonight? Oh, he'll go home tonight. He'll go, he, he lives local, so he'll go home. Uh, our average length of stay from the time they get to the recovery room is four hours. We have the four capability hours. in Ohio to keep people overnight, uh, but he'll, he'll go. He's very, he's very motivated. As you know, we looked at 5,000 consecutive outpatient joints. Just under 7% stayed overnight. Just under 7% stayed overnight. Half of those, 3.5% of the, of the total, stayed for convenience. Done late in the day, medical tourism, lived far away, bad weather, etc. The other half stayed for monitoring of a medical condition, whether that's urinary retention, a, uh, a hypoxia, um, and there was a very low rate. I think it was 9 out of the total knees, so the percentage was like 0.3%, 0.03%. Um, that, uh, that had to stay for pain control. That's really not been one of our issues. Our patients do get out, do leave, and, it, and they're not being discharged to a skilled facility or a rehab center or whatever. They're going home. That's and correct. the hips are going home without PT, and the knees generally get physical, post-op physical therapy. That's correct. But outpatient PT. So I'm gonna fully, this is an all poly tibia. It needs to be fully cemented. There's no surface cement technology here. Um, so I put the suction in the big hole let it uh, sort of negative pressure down into the hole and then bring it out and then we'll fill the hole in. So we are entirely, now remember I had a hole here for the screw so we're going to make sure we cover that up like a little flute. Do we so do air, antibiotic irrigation? That was not a, a, antibiotic irrigation, correct? We do not use antibiotic irrigation. We are looking at some of those technologies. Um, let me mention this. This is the tibia. It's ultra congruent as you can see here. Very much like the saddle. Uh, 
the, the shape of a saddle to keep you from falling off your horse. And then here's the, uh, the fully cemented uh, keel. And perhaps because you have those wings of polyethylene coming out medial and lateral, you've changed some of the uh, rigidity of that component, I would think. Uh, it's rigidity. In addition to the curve on curve. Yep. Yep, exactly. It's rigidity Which and it's curve on the curve. the question of the AGC phenomena. That's exactly right. Do we use indwelling infusing catheters? We use no, no indwelling infusing right? catheters. This is a single shot regional anesthetic that's done um, in pre-op. Um, you know, we've published uh, using uh, some of these liposomal uh, long-acting uh, sustained release thingies, shots and stuff. And basically, it's, our blocks are so good there's no synergistic effect with using any of the liposomal stuff. However, if you're not getting good blocks, or theoretically, if your anesthesiologist wants to take up your OR time to put in their blocks, I would just put the patient to sleep and give them a liposomal uh, periarticular block because the data shows that it's equal to a regional anesthetic. So I do think there's some good indications. What do you do uh, if you have interoperative instability that's not recognized until after cementing? Um, I try not to have that happen. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm being serious. I mean, I, I, I'm going to, I mean, the only way that something's going to happen is if I break something or something, I rip something at this point. Because I've put my trials in and I've gone through the range of motion. I've tried to perfectly balance this knee um, in order to uh, be able to put in a monoblock tibia, all poly, one piece, super convenient, um, without having to monkey around with any of that stuff. So the only real tough part is getting enough flexion to get this dude in there. Mm -hmm. Relax so, a little. I mean, I, I would say that those of you who wait till after you cement to, uh, to pick your final poly, mm -hmm. you know, I do that. Uh, you know, this, you have to get it adjusted to using a system that's a monoblock. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you probably want to practice a little bit by assembling your exactly. modular component and getting happy with doing it that way. And you'll notice I put the trial in as a monoblock. The trials are modular, but I put them in as a monoblock. I want to make sure I know how to get this femur on once I got the monoblock in, what it's going to balance up like, what do I need to retract? Um, if you're going to use any kind of monoblock, whether it's an all poly or not. Well, you know, Adolf, I think it brings up a question of why am I doing an all poly? I'm, I, I mean, there, there was a study that was published last year. Uh, Rob Trudadale and Mike Taunton were the senior authors out of the Mayo Clinic. 16,000 knees, 14% of which were all poly. Survivorship in all age groups. I just want to get rid of some of that fat up there. Just grab that and pull it down. I'm just going to get rid of some of this fat up here. Survivorship in all age groups was better at 20 years with the all poly tibia than a modular metal back tibia, except for the under 55 in which it was equal. Survivorship also was better with an all poly tibia. Now, mm -hmm. Adolf, look mm -hmm. at my AP excursion now. I've really stabilize this knee with that ultra congruent bearing as you're, as you're well so aware So is that ultra congruent bearing thicker posteriorly than mm -hmm. your CR bearing or is it the same thickness? It is not thicker as in there's, no, there's less or more slope, but it is more congruent posteriorly. So yes, it is thicker in right. the back. The dwell point is yeah, the same thickness. Yeah, because you're building up that posterior, it's relatively uh, thicker. Correct. Um, so, so again, that's, you know, the real Are you gonna bone graft the screw hole? I did not yeah. bone graft the screw hole. Okay, um, let's see, uh, what percent, oh, there's a question, what percent of the patients uh, get readmitted or go to another hospital? Um, that's a great question. So uh, if you look at readmitted another hospital or even ER visits, so unplanned uh, care other than in our office, uh, the overall rate, medical and surgical, is 2.2% at 90 days. 2.2, which is, uh, you know, three orders of magnitude lower than the bundle. So we really don't have an issue with patients fleeing to uh, be readmitted or whatever. <laughs> we did have 11 patients uh, uh, that got Home transferred city. to another facility. And those uh, are included in that of, percentage if you do the math. Of, and that's included, exactly. And the most common reason was uh, onset of AFib, which I think is somewhat unavoidable. Um, to talk a little bit about what we found out when we looked at the, so really the hospital patients, which are the sickest, most elderly, more frail patients, considering what we do in the outpatient space is under 65 for the most part. Um, about the labs, do, sh when should I check this guy's hemoglobin? When do I need to check his potassium? What about that manganese or magnesium or chinch bugs? When do we check that? Yeah, so we, uh, 
One of our fellows just looked at uh, close to a thousand cases that we did in the hospital, Turn it down. and that four-hour hemoglobin that we're getting was was uh, useless. And only patients we should even check an H and H on were anybody that maybe had a hemoglobin less than 13 at the time of uh, admission. Or less. And then uh, the potassium, magnesium uh, really was not very helpful. So our data is showing that. Uh, we're over treating, I think, many of the patients, uh, uh, and they really don't need all the things that we're doing. Mm -hmm. How do we manage pain control in those patients at home? Well, all our patients are discharged uh, with um, a, a, a two milligrams of Dilaudid. They get 10 pills of that for the uh, real severe pain. They also go home on oxycodone and hydrocodone and advise on how to tr take each one of those. Yeah, and um, I think Adolf, one, with one the of the most addition of the. Okay. Go ahead. I was going to say one of the most important factors with post-operative pain control is we give them a, a script, not a prescription, they get a bunch of prescriptions, but we give them a script or an outline of when and how to take which medication. Because a lot of times it can be very confusing for these patients who are not terribly medically savvy to know when they're supposed to take a, an oxycodone or when they're supposed to take a Dilaudid, and they end up either taking too little or infrequently taking too much. And so really getting them on a running, uh, uh, COX-2 or anti-inflammatory, uh, they've been given their steroids, um, and then getting them on a program of when to take around-the-clock Tylenol, add in the oxycodone, when that's done, start taking your, your uh, you know, your lower tab or hydrocodone and acetaminophen as much as needed. It's that pre-programming of when to do it and how to do it that I think makes this more successful than some folks who just say, well, I don't have to give them any pain medicines because they do great, or, you know, other, other modalities for pain control. Okay, now you're closing and you haven't let the tourniquet down. Is that normal? The, tourniquet, the tourniquet's down. The tourniquet is down. So the tourniquet is released once we've cemented. We look to see if there's that infamous lateral geniculate bleeder, uh, and he had no issues there. Um, what type of cement? It's a high viscosity cement. Uh, do you need a lead cure for closure? I do well, not. I can answer that. Go ahead, because I, I was. Since my ahead. training with Tom Mallory uh, 28, 9 years ago, I don't remember him ever waiting to have the cement cure, and I don't see that as a big problem in our practice. It's not um, only not a big problem, we, we've never done it, and um, you know, we just recently had submitted and accepted for publication um, 3,000 high-risk knees, high-risk being defined as a BMI of over 35, so all obese, 3,000 knees, one loose tibia. So another question is on the Vank powder. Uh, we add vancomycin to the cement that he was using, so that it was done on the back table. Uh, it's, it's pulverized in a sifter, added to the cement. We did look at a series of knees in which we had uh, used and, uh, uh, the antibiotic cement along with the Vanco. It didn't make a difference. Uh, but it did make a difference in our hips, so we continue to use the powdered Vanco in our hips. And Any other comment in, on the uh, Vanco? Yeah, in that study, or, um, we do not cement our hips. So for those of you that are cementing hips, we don't have any data. But in our knees, we cement all the knees, and they all had antibiotic impregnated cement that came out of the box with the, cement, uh, with the antibiotics already in it. And then we were adding the Vanco powder to the wound at the end of the operation. We saw no difference in uh, infection rates with a, a very large number of patients. And so we decided to just kind of skip that and add the vancomycin to the high viscosity um, pre-colored cement. And, uh, and make our own sort of antibiotic laden cement on the back table. Okay, and then the other question here was, uh, uh, what's your, your thoughts on the betadine irrigation? Um, my thoughts are there's good data on it, we've never done it. Okay, uh, and uh, topical TXA is another question. So here's, here's the issue, we give everyone oral TXA, which the study out of Russia shows has a good uh, chemical equivalency to uh, the IV if given appropriately. That's basically a double dose and a little further ahead of time. Uh, my PA, Matt Bluer, is going to come over and help finish this up. I think topical TA has shown to reduce the risk of transfusion and reduce the overall blood loss in almost every study that's been done equal, basically, to IV TA. IV TA has been shown to be equal to oral TA when administered correctly. So I'm going to use parenteral TA versus or, or, you know, other than topical versus topical, okay? The one interesting study that I saw was in massive military trauma where you're having whole body type transfusions. You're not gonna change the transfusion rate because they're having 
20, 30 units transfused over a period of time with these massive military traumas. What they did increase with IVTA was survivorship. And so the theory is, if you're giving it in the body as opposed to just in the wound, in the wound helps with blood loss and transfusion. In the body, perhaps, helps with reducing the risk of some of the other side effects of blood loss. And perhaps, because it blocks that coagulation, or excuse me, the, the, uh, the um, anticoagulation cascade, perhaps it's overall beneficial for the body. That's based on military trauma, not on total knees or total hips. But that's why we, you know, the Mayo Clinic study showed the patients who had a risk factor that would be a contraindication to uh, administering IVTA that got IVTA had the lowest chance of complication, even versus those that got TA that didn't have a contraindication to TA. So there's something that happens by giving it to the body and not just the knee or the hip. I think that the real compelling thing for me on, on this operation, and, and admittedly, this is, this is entirely different than, than the way that we've trained uh, here at Joint Implant Surgeons, and it, the all poly tibia, I think the data is really mounting that, that this uh, may have a survivorship advantage. Uh, it makes the operation super easy and super efficient uh, without modularity and whatnot. Um, there's no issues of backside wear and locking mechanisms and whatnot. Um, so that, that's the, the reason why we, we've pushed a little bit more towards all poly tibias and the appropriate patients. And then, uh, like, for example, I personally wouldn't be comfortable doing it in a real osteoporotic female patient, although the data doesn't say that I should be worried about it. But that's a patient that I would much rather, a difficult operation, morbidly obese patients, big muscular men, I'd rather use a, a standard modular uh, base plate um, that, that I like to use um, just for ease and convenience and, and number of reps um, or repetitions. And then the other thing is we didn't resurface the patella, which I know, Adolph, you continue to do all comers. Um, uh, we've we being Jason and I and, and Mike Morris have pushed a little bit more towards selective resurfacing uh, based on understanding of a lot of the data that's coming out of a lot of different places that it probably isn't the most important variable. Uh, perhaps the most important variable is what was the status of the patient's native ACL at the time of total knee. Meaning that if they had an intact ACL and you did a total knee instead of a uni, they're going to have more anterior knee pain than if they had an absent ACL at the time of their primary knee. Okay. Well, on that, those points, we uh, all want to give you a round of applause to you and Jason. And uh, more importantly, to the AV team, thank you, uh, to Anesthesia, and to all the people who stayed late, because you know, back home, it's uh, almost seven tonight. So thanks uh, to our team, my team, that stayed late. Appreciate you. Yeah, Adolph, I re just to reiterate, I want to thank uh, Brittany and Jordan and, and our anesthesia team. Um, you can't see who's up top right now. Um, and, uh, and all the other folks from White Fence Surgical Suites that did stay late in order to put this uh, procedure on for you. Uh, they do a, a smash-up job, and uh, we really appreciate it very much.